Good morning, everyone. Today is the second of our talks by Lionel Corbett. Today, we're going to be talking about personality and spirituality. I'm here today with Dr. Gard Jameson, Dr. Will Lynn, and Dr. Lionel Corbett. Welcome, Lionel. Thank you very much, Dana, for that introduction. Uh, what I'd like to do today is talk about the relationship between a person's spirituality, uh, their personality, their image of God, and all of that, especially in relation to the early relational dynamics in, in the family of origin. Um, many people have some kind of idea about God. If you ask them, how do they talk about God? What's their concept of God? They'll say something. Even atheists have a concept of God they don't actually believe in. So what I'm interested in is how does one's spirituality or one's image of God arise? So I'll give you a little bit about the, the background uh, to this question, and then I want to talk about what we know about uh, Martin Luther and St. Paul, if we have time, to illustrate the relationship between childhood dynamics and one's uh, spirituality. So uh, it's well known that children, even as young as three years old, can have a rudimentary image of God. And this, is, this image that they have is based on a combination of the ways in which people behave in the child's family of origin and the God imagery the child is taught at Sunday school and so on. And the big um, uh, important factor is that the God image that you have is affected by whether the family child rearing practices are harsh and punitive or loving and forgiving. So if you have a punitive angry parent that tends to be projected onto your image of a dangerous God. If you have loving forgiving parents you tend to have that kind of God image. Or you might develop a God image that compensates for the shortcomings that you had uh, with your parents. So as well as those family dynamics, we have clergy, religious education, all that can modify the way one thinks about God in one's mind. And a lot of these kind of transmission of religious beliefs are, are, are transmitted by culture and family and become unconscious. They're internalized and they're kind of uh, sensed as a kind of felt truth. Whatever is the preconceived notion about God that's taken for granted in the family and the culture becomes uh, internalized. Now this goes back at least as far as Freud from a psychological point of view. Um, Freud thought that God was a kind of exalted father image in the psyche, but this is a mistake. Uh, in fact, one's God image might more closely represent characteristics of a child's mother or grandmother than father. And very many research, uh, much research in this area says that our sense of the sacred is actually based on very powerful early mother experiences. These early psychological experiences with mother leave a residue that's the psychological origin of religion. So for example, when you're singing hymns in church about the love of God, according to this theory, you are actually evoking early experiences of being mothered. And it's often been suggested that people's yearning for God is like the yearning for the very early pre edible mother. And it turns out that the parent that's most emotionally important to you has the largest effect on coloring your, your God image. Now this God image will, modif will be modified throughout your life as it's affected by life experiences. Your life experiences might confirm or they might deny what your religious tradition tells you. So people often end up with a very private God image, which is a combination of theological teachings, life experiences, and these childhood residues, and much of them are unconscious. And um, eventually, for many people, if this childhood God image doesn't develop, it can be experienced as irrelevant or as the individual matures. But for people who are interested in religion, the individual's God image tends to become more sophisticated. Another possibility that many people raise is that the divine itself contributes to your God image. You remember that Jung said there's an innate God image in the psyche 
it's a priori, it's not internalized. Uh, it's not the result of interjection of family and culture. But there's no doubt that this is just a potential and family and culture will fill in the potential. Um, and we know that there are aspects of the individual's God image that are not exclusively the result of early family and influences because dreams occur in which God images appear in ways that are not necessarily related to parental imagos or what they told you in Sunday school. Now just to illustrate this connection between parental images and, and a God image, if you have very demanding narcissistic parents, you, you may well have a narcissistic God image. And we see this in the Hebrew Bible in commandments such as, you shall have no other gods before me. That represents a narcissistic God image. That's the kind of God image that sets high standards, demands obedience, and so on. And all that corresponds to a certain style of child rearing. If you are a child who has to meet uh, his or her parents' need for affirmation, if, if love and, uh, and acceptance of your parents are conditional, and if you have a constant threat of parental withdrawal or parental abandonment, you often have a God image that's very insecure uh, and very uh, uncertain about the state of the relationship. Um, if you have a punitive God image, you may be worried about your eventual salvation. But if you have a theory of uh, a theology of eternal life, that will alleviate that and it will alleviate your, your uh, death anxiety. But if you have a very punitive God image, this can cause a great deal of anxiety if you'll believe there'll be retribution after death for sin. All that kind of thing is based on harsh parenting. Now, psychopathology is very important in this context as well. People with severe psychopathology have negative images of God. If you look at schizoid and paranoid people, you find that they think that God is detached and passive. And if you look at obsessionals, they see God as a kind of harsh, punitive judge. And if you have early trauma, then you often think of God as irrelevant or distant or unavailable. Where were you when I needed you? And in later life, um, serious trauma can completely destroy any notion that you had of a loving God. How could this happen to me if there's a loving God? And this kind of uh, trauma later in life can destroy a belief system that was actually a very important buttress to the s stability of one's sense of self. So early trauma can radically affect one's God image. Now, there is a kind of traditional patriarchal God image, um, especially in the Hebrew Bible, of a kind of imperial triumphant war God who hands down the law that has to be followed. And that will appeal to people whose parents fit this kind of description, to parents that you had to submit to completely. Um, if you look at medieval iconography, where there are images of hell that these uh, images will either terrify the individual into conformity or sometimes they'll, if you're sadistic, they'll allow you to enjoy watching rebe rebellious people suffer. Now that kind of punitive God image is often related to a punitive superego, a punitive conscience that results from very harsh parenting. The harsh parenting is simply transferred onto a punitive God image. If you have critical parents, you may unconsciously believe that God is looking over your shoulder all the time, ready to criticize you. Or you might be very preoccupied with the need to be good because that pleased your parents and you want to please God. And this kind of God image uh, can be seen in psychotherapy and it can modify as the parental images are explored. If you have parents that induce excessive guilt and shame in children, then you tend to have a God image or a theology which says that people are sinful. Um, and if, you're, if you grow up feeling sinful because you were criticized and told you were not good enough all the time, you are predisposed to believe in a savior who relieves you of guilt. So people are drawn to God, image that, God images that reflect their psychological structures. If you are afflicted with guilt and shame in childhood, you may have a theology that stresses divine censure. 
unfortunately, the Judeo-Christian tradition has fostered the idea that suffering is a punishment for sin. So whenever we suffer, if we, if we had that kind of theological background, we may wonder what the heck did I do to deserve this? So for example, in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, drought and famine and death often occur when God's commandments are disobeyed. And the prophets say that the nation of Israel was conquered by invaders because the nation was unfaithful to God. The Psalms say that sin makes the body sick. Jesus warns about the wrath of God turned against the wicked and so on. These are the kind of threats that are used as ways of controlling people. And they all take advantage of unconscious guilt and shame that may have roots in the family of origin. Uh, and we know this because the Bible uses parental metaphors. For example, when God punishes the people of Israel for their iniquities, because God loves them, I'm punishing you because I love you. That's in Amos. Or God disciplines you for your own good. That's in Hebrews. Or God's anger is always contained within God's compassion, according to Lamentations. These kind of biblical comments are, are uh, what Alice Miller calls for your own good rationalizations that are used by abusive parents. And of course, you can understand the ambivalence felt by a child towards a punitive parent just as you can understand uh, the, the religious believer's ambivalence towards a punitive God who's also supposed to be a shepherd and who's supposed to protect the innocent and the poor and save the oppressed, but is punitive at the same time. Now this tendency to blame all evil on human sinfulness begins right at the beginning with the story of Adam and Eve and it continues throughout the Bible. And this assertion of universal human sinfulness is actually central to much Christian teaching. Now, if you happen to have been raised by parents who were punitive and guilt-inducing, then this kind of attitude from your uh, religious tradition will worsen your low self-esteem. And sometimes these kind of complexes are more important determinants of your God image than the actual teachings of the tradition. So, because of these early relational dynamics in your family of origin, even people who belong to very conservative religious traditions may have a benevolent God image if they grew up in a benevolent family. And people from a liberal tradition may have a very punitive God image if they grew up in that kind of family. There are many individual psychodynamics like this that are projected onto God images. So, for example, um, all the Abrahamic traditions have notions of a judgment day, uh, the end times when people will be judged. This, of course, is connected unconsciously to the fear of parental judgment. Wait till your father comes home, that kind of thing. So notions such as the end times probably develop to satisfy a need that we have for ultimate retribution, the books, will finally be balanced. Reward and punishment will accrue in the next life. In fact, I think belief in an afterlife is actually a way of coping with death anxiety. Now there's also a very significant correlation between uh, one's God image and one's self image. How you, uh, how you feel about yourself, your self esteem and your God image. Uh, if you have positive self-worth, you think that you're a worthwhile, valuable person, you tend to have a loving God image. Uh, if you have a very negative sense of self, I'm not worth much, I'm kind of worthless, you tend to have threatening and punitive God image. If you can accept yourself, you tend to have a more accepting God image. People who've had early trauma, early abandonment, or people whose parents were detached and cold, tend to experience God as either irrelevant or distant or punitive. So these people are repeating the pattern of their early relationships. They may assume that God is an angry judge, they have to live up to high expectations and so on, and that kind of thing is reinforced sometimes by religious education. Um, so not only do we project our own psychology onto our God image, we also, by the way, we, we try to identify with the idealized quality of, our, of the God image that we prefer. 
And then we try to make those qualities of that God image part of our own self image. So if you have a loving God, you try to be loving and so on. Now, one of the main ways of understanding this connection is using attachment theory. All traditional theists assume that uh, my God will be available always as needed. So attachment theory says that the need for this kind of attachment figure and belief in its constant availability is a fundamental dynamic underlying all the theistic religions. So attachment needs explain why faith in God provides emotional security that's always present for believer. So attachment theory says that the quality of your God image is formed on the basis of the quality of attachment that you have with your primary caregivers. So if you believe in God or the Blessed Virgin Mary or Jesus, these are perfectly reliable attachment figures and they're available for protection in the event of danger. And the style of your attachment to your God image will correspond to the way you were attached to your early caregivers, or it may compensate for your early attachment style. So in other words, you may attach to God in a way that's similar to the way you were attached to an early uh, attachment figure. Or God can become a substitute attachment figure when the early care caregivers were not available. So um, you, you can compensate. Um, for example, if you had uh, uh, early relationships, parents who were distant or unavailable, you can develop an image of God that's loving and totally available. And if you have a secure attachment style, you tend to see God in a benevolent light. God is caring and loving, and I'm worthy of God's love. If you have insecure attachment, you're more likely to see God as angry and demanding and punitive. Um, but sometimes that person will, will find God is a more secure attachment than I than they could achieve in, in their early human relationships. If you have anxious, ambivalent attachment styles, then that tends to correlate with the idea that God meets out punishment inconsistently. If you have avoidant attachment, you may have the sense that God is remote. In other words, you can believe that God is loving or constantly present or abandoning, depending on your early attachment history. And you can either rebel against God or give up on the idea of God or be obedient, depending on your early attachment history, or even deny that God exists. But if you do believe in a loving God, the tendency is to, to feel that you have a sense of meaning and direction and purpose in life. And these factors are very important for psychological and physical health. The, the sense of a loving God provides confidence that one is cared for, and it, it's very helpful if one is suffering. The, the, if you have a loving relationship with God, that tends to have a protective effect that helps you through periods of adversity and provides consolation. And these loving images of God will also support self-esteem. For traditional Roman Catholics, the uh, image of Mary is that kind of very powerful image of maternal love. Now, to illustrate this, uh, re these relationships between early childhood dynamics and uh, one's God image, I'd like to talk about uh, Martin Luther, uh, who was born in 1483 and died in 1546, and was responsible for the Reformation in the 1527 or when, whenever it began. He, he provides us with a very good example of the relationship between a, a personality development, uh, what happened in childhood, and a God image. Now I have just a little caveat here because this is an excursion into what's called psychohistory or psychobiography. And in some circles, I have to warn you, this doesn't have a good reputation because people say, how can we make an accurate psychological assessment of a very complex character who lived 400 years ago? We don't have him in our therapy office. All we've got is published material. We don't know how accurate that is. So what we have to go on is there's a large amount of uh, written material, Luther's writing, his speeches, and some examples of behavior have been preserved. 
there is always the problem of the bias of the editors and translators, but I think Luther had a real gift for language, and, and I find his writing often very emotionally intense, and to me it doesn't seem edited, but I have to acknowledge there'll be a degree of speculation here, and I'm basing it on the texts, obviously, I, I, because I didn't have access to him personally. And I think it, it would be a mistake to completely ignore what happened to him developmentally and to ignore the relationship between character structure and theology. The opposite mistake would be to use psychological theory to explain too much without taking into account um, uh, the historical and religious context of the character. Explaining too much was a big critique of one of the early major biographies of Luther by Eric Erickson in 1958. Uh, he tried to use psychoanalytic theory and he did over explain, but we've advanced a lot since the 1950s and we know much more about trauma and the effect uh, of early relationships than, than we did in, in um, Eric Erickson's day. But I will draw on some of Eric Erickson's work. Um, but I have to admit, we don't know how reliable some of the information is, and we don't know how much weight to give it. So, for example, we know that his relationship to his father, Luther's relationship to his father, was very important. But there were other factors as well. There, there was the whole historical and religious context. Okay, so here goes. So we know that Luther was chronically melancholic, uh, and depressive. He suffered from a kind of spiritual despair or a, a persistent brooding sadness. Now some biographers, um, there are many biographies of Luther, some people think this depression was endogenous, it was kind of uh, genetic and not to do with his environment, but I'm sure it, it was psychologically understandable. But it's very prominent. He said, this is a quote, sorrow is the essence of human existence. So clearly he's very concerned of it, with it. And he tries to make sense of his depression in religious terms. He says it's a spiritual sickness. He says, Satan causes us to dwell on our sins, and that produces melancholy. He also says he was driven by fear and the need to control it particularly had a great fear of death, and he struggled with the question of whether God could really raise us from the dead. The problem being, of course, if I have faith in God, why would I be afraid of death? It seems, according to most biographers, he felt very unworthy and that his sins would keep him from God and make God angry with him. And he had a deep sense of sinfulness, at least for the per first part of his life, when he understood Christ to be a kind of punitive judge. Uh, he was so anxious that when he said his first mass after his ordination in 1507, he was so terrified of God that he had a panic attack in the middle of it, and he had, uh, and he had to be persuaded to come back and finish the mass. So he was in constant doubt about his salvation and whether God was, would forgive him at that time. Now, how did he get such a harsh God image? Well, one source of this melancholia was that as a child, he was regularly and severely beaten by his father. Now, some Luther specialists will deny this, but I think there's good evidence for it. For example, um, the, uh, there are his table talks, which were notes taken by his followers during meals. And uh, in one of them, uh, during his childhood, Luther says, this is a quote, my father once whipped me so severely that I fled from him, and it was difficult for him to win me back again to himself. Now, of course, this kind of severe corporal punishment was probably common among the child-rearing practices of the day. But I, I get the sense that Luther was a very sensitive child, and this affected him very deeply. And Erickson also says that Martin was afraid of his father and hated him and was deeply sad about the way his father treated him. Martin couldn't, Luther couldn't get close to his father, but couldn't get away from his father, which is a terrible bind to be in. And um, it may be that this rage at his father was a source of Martin's doubt about divine righteousness because his father's behavior was not necessarily consistent. 
Now, it wasn't just at home. When he was seven years old, Luther went to Latin school, and here he was beaten again. He was beaten, for example, if he lapsed into German instead of Latin. He was beaten if he spoke out of turn. There was no verbal freedom at all. And later on, interestingly, it became very important to speak his mind against what he thought were papal abuses. And it was important to him to feel that his words were divinely inspired divinely sanctions anyway. In the school, every time he acted against the rules, uh, this was recorded in a secret ledger and he was beaten for bad behavior. Now, so there was a great deal of beating at home and in school. I think this is the kind of abuse that today we know that would produce severe emotional damage. Uh, and Erickson agrees. Erickson says this kind of beating produces a, a mute, what he calls a mutilation of the child's spirit. And modern theory, for example, Shen, Shengold would see this as a, this kind of constant trauma as a form of soul, soul murder. So this kind of childhood abuse, I think, contributed to Luther's anxiety, where he, he constantly felt he was being attacked by God. He was judged as a child all the time, and he was afraid of the judgment of God. Now, Donald Capps says that this kind of melancholia can also happen if you have a loss of mother's love in childhood, especially if mother uh, withdraws in a very cruel and traumatic manner. And this happened to Luther. His mother did that to him. For example, there's one episode in which he stole one nut and his mother beat him till the blood flowed for stealing a nut. So the idea is that that kind of uh, early trauma will lead, will, will lead you to look for a new religious object that you can trust, okay? So we know that both parents were very harsh disciplinarians, and this can lead to a deep sense of self-hatred. And this is one possibility why the Bible was so important to Luther, because the Bible has a kind of maternal quality for Luther. Um, uh, the Bible was a kind of maternal voice for Luther that reassured and, reassured and comforted him. Um, so the scriptures became a kind of perfect or ideal mother. They, they reduce his despair and his anxiety. And that's why he insists on the importance of the scripture for salvation. He has a doctrine of sola scriptura, scriptures alone, or the Bible contains everything we need for salvation. So from the point of view of uh, cohort psychology, of uh, self-psychology, the scriptures produce a, uh, provide a very important idealized self-object function for Luther. They soothe him, they calm him, they comfort him in a maternal kind of way. So we know that both his parents were very traumatically unempathic. They were recurrently abusive. They were chronically uh, unable to be uh, responsive to him. And there wasn't much opportunity for repair of the connection. And this kind of betrayal by parents predisposes children to depression. It violates the bond of trust between parents and children. And that kind of failing self-object uh, milieu in childhood leads to internal emptiness, hopelessness, despair, and, and damage to, one, to the child's sense of self. So given this traumatic uh, environment in childhood, I think we can see Luther's spiritual search, search, spiritual search as an attempt to find an unfailing self-object or an unfailing attachment object. Now, it's not surprising that given this constant harsh treatment, he had a, Luther had a strong sense of sinfulness and guilt. And that predisposed him to religious scrupulousness and kind of obsessional ruminations when he was stressed. He struggled for years to feel that he was worthy of God's grace, but he was never quite sure that he was sufficiently contrite because he's constantly worried about his worthiness. So he stresses humility, he stresses the idea that we can claim no merit in ourselves, we're worthless. And this to me sounds like a self-esteem problem projected into his theology, which is not, not surprising given the uh, 
traumatic uh, childhood he had. But he eventually finds solace in the idea that God's acceptance is based on who we are, not what we do. It's not a question of works, it's a question of who we are. And this justification is given by grace, by divine grace, which means here um, undiver undeserved divine acceptance. But this uh, grace is not achieved by human work, it's not achieved by what you do. And that's one of the reasons he rejected indulgences, because indulgence, you know, the the idea that you could buy um, getting your relatives out of purgatory. Because indulgences mean that instead of depending on being dependent on God's grace, this was something you could buy yourself. Now remember that nothing was ever good enough for Luther's teachers or for his father. It was very hard to please them. And this harshness is reflected in Luther's belief that it's actually impossible to obey God's law fully. The law is intended to show us our sinfulness, which is an idea that I think is related to his sense in childhood that he could do no right, no matter how hard he tried. So we had something of a theology of human helplessness and divine omnipotence. We are so guilty that we are only saved by faith, which I think arises from his very punitive superego. But he did often assert that we have no righteousness, that righteousness only comes from the righteousness of Christ that's attributed to us vicariously through faith. And he actually says, I, this is a quote from Luther, I hated that word righteousness of God, by which God is righteousness and punishes sinners and the unrighteous. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I was a sinner before God with a disturbed conscience. I couldn't believe he was placated by my satisfaction. I hated the righteous God who punished sinners. Secretly, blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God. So you can hear how he's projecting his feelings about his father onto his God image. It's very clear in that kind of passage. It took him a long time to find a, a God image that was a mixture of both anger and compassion. And Erickson said he had, to, he had to eventually forgive God for being a father because of his own father problem. Erickson also says, by the way, that Luther split the problem of paternal authority by submitting to the father God and rebelling against the authority of the Pope, the Holy Father. It's very interesting to me that Luther's anxiety had a kind of obsessional quality about it. He was extremely scrupulous he, he, in terms of his religious practices like prayer. He was very concerned with getting everything perfect in relation to God. He was also very preoccupied with cleanliness and he was chronically constipated and he would often use scatological language, especially talking about his enemies, language about uh, excrement. I won't use the language itself. But he, he strained to obey the monastic rules and prayers in a very obsessional way. He would pray and fast and keep vigils, freeze himself uh, in cold rooms and so on a great deal of self-punitive behavior, which may, I think, may have been an unconscious attempt to win back the approval of the divine parent by being good. So he had a lot of obsessional anxiety and he would use religious practices to try to soothe the anxiety. And what helped him was the discovery of the idea of justification by faith alone. Based, this is based on Romans 117, he who lives through faith, he who through faith is righteousness is righteous shall live and this idea finally allowed him some peace and he decided that this uh, righteousness of god is not punitive finally but is a gift through faith in christ but although he made this discovery and although he he had the idea that we couldn't achieve righteousness and God freely gives it, he continued to suffer from anxiety all his life. For example, he was very worried that he'd made a mistake in his theology and he'd led people astray. And after the Re uh, Reformation in the, in the 1520s, 
he would constantly hear a haunting inner voice that said, uh, that would ask him again and again, du bist allein klug, meaning roughly, are you the only clever one? Are you the only smart one? Which I think was a kind of obsessional rumination. And this kind of constant self-doubt kept him in constant despair, and he was afraid he would go to hell. And so when he was afraid he would go to hell, he said, this is a test from the devil that strengthens my faith. He had a lifelong belief in the concrete reality of the devil, who he thought might even make him question the existence of God. Although we, we shouldn't judge this belief in the devil by modern standards, because I, I'm not quite sure to what extent he, he was affected by a belief that he was living in the last days before the apocalypse, or that there was a, a contest going on between God and Satan and so on. But that, that's the kind of belief that may explain why he was an advocate of the burning of witches. And in this negative context, I want to say something about his very bitter anti-Judaism, which I think in some ways contributed to the Holocaust because some Lutheran was so important in Nazi Germany. Um, and cultural antisemitism was an endemic part of Luther's Europe. Now, early in his life, Luther was very tolerant of the Jews and advocated kindness. But later on in his life, he was became very vituperative. And in 1543, he wrote a book called uh, On the Jews and Their Lies, uh, in which he repeats medieval superstitions about Jews killing Christian children and uh, poisoning wells and so on. And he advocates the destruction of Jewish uh, schools and houses and so on, and says the Jews should become slaves of Christians. Now, his um, apologists say, well, this anti-Jewish polemic was due to ill health. He may even been dementing at the end of his life. But this stuff did occur towards the end of his life. Um, and they also say he was disappointed because the Jews wouldn't convert to his brand of Christianity. He'd hoped they would embrace his approach. Uh, and he had disagreements with the rabbinical authorities about the interpretation of the Bible and so on. Or he may have just been reflecting the anti-Semitic values of his society. But I'm very struck by the virulence of, of his anti-Semitism. I, I, when I read it, I, I see a remarkable capacity for hatred. Now, I thought I might digress and say a little bit about this because the, the usual psychodynamic explanation for anti-Semitism is the projection of the bigoted person's personal shadow and the displacement of aggression and hatred. Displacement occurs that you, displacement means you redirect a negative feeling from its original source to a less threatening source, okay? And I think these defenses will tell us a bit more about Luther's psychology because anti-Semitism is found among people with authoritarian personalities and authoritarian personalities are produced by harsh parental discipline and very dominant parents. Uh, Freud talked about this. He said Jews evoke envy. Freud said Jews evoke envy because they assert that they're chosen by God. So, so the, envy is, the envy occurs. And also, they are the people who transmitted the moral law, and that, con that produces resentment because we don't like to follow the moral law. So anti-Judaism is actually a, a disguised form of anti-Christian feelings and resentment at having to behave well. Uh, so so uh, unconscious hatred of God or the ethical demands of Christianity can be displaced onto the Jews. So the Jews, in other words, represent the superego, how you're supposed, how you're supposed to behave. Um, and um, so they attract attacks. So Jesus would unconsciously be hated because he was compassionate, he was loving, he preached forgiveness, and it's hard to meet these standards. So instead of hating Jesus, who makes these impossible demands on us, we hate the Jews. Um, it's, it's also safe to victimize the Jews because they don't believe in Jesus's divinity. And so they reject the incarnation. So uh, Luther probably assumed that it was okay to attack the Jews. 
He felt morally justified. He felt he was obeying the will of God. And he said, I'm, I'm, by attacking the Jews, I'm practicing a sharp mercy by saving them from the glowing flames of hell. So blaming the victims. Another dynamic that might be relevant here is that the, the more precarious are one's own beliefs, the more you uh, displace your own doubt onto non-believers. And then you can attack your own doubt uh, in projection out there. And again, I, I think his capacity for hatred was his father's harshness. And I, I suspect that his hatred of his father was displaced onto the Jews, but that's really a speculation. Um, uh, but it's interesting to me that he referred to the Jews as devils, which was a very common medieval attribution. And of course, preoccupation with the devil is now understood to represent the projection of one's own shadow material. So I, I think this confirms the idea that the Jews represented a projective scapegoat for him. I should say parenthetically that Luther's antisemitism was formally repudiated by the Luther Lutheran Evangelical Church in 1994. So it took him 450 years to get round to this. Um, and um, the other very important point is that all this theological development can be seen in terms of his psychological problems, but none of that will say anything about the truth of his views about divine grace or the truth of his doctrine of salvation. And if you're a, a faithful Christian, then his work as a theologian might be more important to you than the psychological sources of the theology. The knowing the psychological sources don't tell you, doesn't tell you whether the theology is true or not. Now, I don't know whether you would like to stop at this point or whether I should go on and talk about St. Paul, which... Um, I, have, I have a question for you, Lionel. Um, yes. A friend of mine who's a theologian said, uh, referring to Genesis, you know, in the beginning, God created us in his image and we quickly returned the favor. Yes, exactly. Yes. 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 Is yes. very clearly in line with that. Baylor did a study suggested that 77% of a very large group of Christians, over 5,000 Christians were surveyed and found their God image to be critical, distant, and authoritarian. Yeah. Only 23% thought that God was sometimes benevolent. Yeah. My question has to do with how that translates into cultural violence. And it's very in particular, the, the doctrine of the atonement strikes me as a, a sort of consummate articulation of that justification of violence. I completely agree. Culture. The crucifix, the crucifix, and what about the sacrifice of a son? If God can sacrifice his son, we can send our sons to war. I hope that doesn't offend committed Christians, but, but this kind of, and, and of course the Hebrew Bible God image is full of violence, war and violence and extreme harsh punishment. So, so my I, question I, is, does individuation help us individually to shift that image of the divine? Is there a yes. shift that occurs or a reparenting, if you will? Yes. You yes, as you, as you, as you uh, transform your images of your parents and work out the, the parental complexes, you radically change your God image. Um, I can give an example of that if, if you're interested. Um, um, of, um, um, well, one example is a woman who has a punitive God image uh, because of a very angry punitive father, um, works on her father material in the ordinary way in psychotherapy. And after some years of work on this, um, has a dream. Um, Oh, well, I, the early dream, which, which illustrates the punitive God image based on the father problem, is that she has a dream in which she's lying in bed and a hook comes down from the sky, hooks her through the chest, lifts her up, and she looks down and she sees um, a man with a long white beard and white garments, and he starts firing a cannon at her. And she's hopelessly suspended in midair. She can't get out of the way. And then she realizes that's God firing at her. So that's an example of a very punitive God image. 
Some years later, when she's worked on the father problem, she has a dream that she's taken into a huge room in which there are God images of many religious traditions, and she's told that she can choose any one of them. And the one she chooses is an image of the laughing Buddha, Hote or Pote, he was a, a ninth century Zen monk. You know, he has a big belly and big smile and big ears and a bag of goodies for the kids. But the point is, he's joyful. It's a, it's a radical change in her spirituality. So that's an example of what Jung, in one of his letters, says is a, uh, the transformation of the God image. He says, as you go more and more into the unconscious, you'll find these untransformed God images and work on the complexes can change these kind of God images. That's why really your spirituality and your psychology are not really separate at that level. I hope that was a long-winded answer. I'd love to hear you talk about Paul because it strikes me that he had a similar shift in. Yes. In Shall we do that? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm interested in Paul's God image, and I'm also, how he arrived at it, I'm also interested in his relentless traveling and writing and preaching and the way he could um, maintain his hope in the face of tremendous hardship and periods of despair, frequently being beaten and so on. Now, um, we don't know anything about his childhood, so this is really, obviously, has the same problem as any other psychobiography we have we can only rely on on the text we have this tremendous historical uh, distance we have disagreements about the authorship of, of his letters among specialists we don't know how accurately the letters have been conveyed we don't know how much has been distorted by his followers and so on so we have to make very tentative com conclusions here but but this is an important piece of work because he had such an overwhelming influence on the Christian tradition. Uh, so much of modern Christianity is Pauline. So I'm going to try and use his writing, what we know of his writing, to dis discern the relationship between his psychology and his God image. I'm going to use his writing to give us hints about his personality. But you have to understand that this is only based on the text. And I'm kind of empathically trying to sense the subjective experience that was driving the behavior. I'm also going to use contemporary theory, and I don't know if we can apply contemporary theory to someone who lived a couple of thousand years ago, a very different culture. So those are all caveats. Now, his letters, anyway, suggest that he had a lot of internal tension and conflict and a sense of personal badness. For example, Romans 7, he says, I, I do what I don't want to do. I do what I hate rather than what I know is good. And there's a law of sin that dwells in my members. This is often thought to represent his sexuality. We aren't sure. He says he's a wretched man. I need to be rescued from my body of death. And he has a lot of self-criticism and he, he splits. He says, I of myself, this is Romans 7, 25, I of myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There's the tremendous split and the tremendous self-criticism. So not surprisingly, he feels that only divine grace and not human effort can remove human evil. And I think before he became an apostle, he, he used ritual practices in his traditional Judaism to try to get rid of the sense of guilt. But these practices, I suspect, only had a temporary effect. So it was a big relief to him to realize that belief in Jesus would justify him before, before God, even if he was sinful. Now, I think he had a harsh superego because he's so preoccupied with sin. He doesn't pay much attention to many places in the Hebrew scriptures, which I'm sure he knew well, that teach that God forgives sin, which you find in various places. Um, he's so aggressive that he, he curses anyone, even an angel from heaven who preaches a different gospel message than his own. And this begins a really a long tradition of Christian intolerance. Uh, here's a comment from Mark. Uh, 
He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So this, this is a, a very intolerant strand within the Christian tradition. And there are currents of paranoid anxiety and aggression in Paul. For example, he has this apocalyptic idea, quote, of a day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed and angels in flaming fire will take vengeance on the non-believers. At one point in Acts, he blinds a man he considers to be a false prophet. And he says, uh, I wish that those who unsettle you would mutilate themselves. Sometimes this phrase is translated as castrate themselves. So he's got quite vindictive attitudes and sadistic fantasies, which suggests to me a great deal of rage. And I think he must have had a kind of narcissistic vulnerability that didn't let him tolerate disagreement. Now, of course, he, he, he had a major conversion experience on the road to Damascus, where he hears Jesus's voice saying, why do you persecute me? And then he becomes a believer in a radical change of mind. But before that, he was very intolerant. He, he says he persecuted unbelievers in a raging fury. So he was a bit of a fanatic. Fanaticism denies doubt. Doubt in fanatics is projected onto non-believers and attacked externally. And he, so his division of humanity into the saved and the damned, saved and the damned, reveals this capacity for splitting and projection. So he doesn't say my adversaries are wrong. He says my adversaries, adversaries are wicked. And he makes this very sharp distinction between people who believe in Christ and those who don't. And he says non-believers are consigned to eternal damnation. Only believers will enjoy eternal life. The world is split between believers and unbelievers. This kind of splitting is actually psychologically quite primitive. Some will be saved, some will not be saved. Um, and uh, he projects all this negativity onto pagans and Jews who didn't believe in Jesus. He says they're enemies of God. But he also acknowledges his own Jewish origins. In, in Romans 9.11, he says that the Jews supply the root onto which the Gentiles have been grafted, and it's the root that support you. So the Jews are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. So he has a mixture of love and hate towards his own people. And I think this is what the Kleinians call depressive anxiety, the, the fear of harming a good internal object. He has a lot of guilt, and this makes him experience great, he quote, great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, and the wish to be accursed for the sake of his Jewish kinsmen. It's a peculiar mixture of love and hate. The reason I mention all this is that his negative writing about the Jews has helped to legitimate their persecution ever since the fourth century. And the positive comments about the Jews have been used to combat antisemitism. It's curious how you can use his writing in either direction. I'm very interested in, in this capacity for splitting. So before the conversion, as I said, he was scrupulous and zealous about following Jewish law, although he felt he couldn't do it completely. And he violently persecuted Jesus' followers, encouraging them to be killed. He would drag them off to prison. Then after the conversion, he becomes a devoted follower of Jesus, brings him to the Gentile world. Um, what happened to change him? Why, why did he make this radical shift? Some people say divine intervention. Some people say psychodynamic factors. Certainly the encounter with Christ on the Damascus road was a big catalyst. Um, now, some people say you can't analyze that. It was a divine revelation. He heard Jesus' voice saying, why do you persecute me? He sees a brilliant light. He's blind for three days and so on. But the fact that we can talk about this stuff psychologically doesn't mean it doesn't have religious significance. So a psychological interpretation is not necessarily reductive or iconoclastic. So why did he have this kind of conversion experience? I think there were several factors. Um, he saw Christians face death very bravely, like Stephen, who was a Jewish convert who was martyred and died saying, 
Lord, do not hold this sin against them. I think he must have, Paul must have been very deeply affected by these kind of events, which I think must have instilled doubts about him, about his attacks, because they had a kind of peace that he needed. In the numinous experience on the road to Damascus, he, all, he heard Jesus' voice say, it hurts you to kick against the goads, Acts 26. So goads were used to force the direction of oxen in the field. So this, now this usually means you've been trying to resist divine will. But I think he had a secret attraction to Christianity before the conversion experience, and he was using his fury at Jesus' followers to drown out this fascination before the conversion. Because he was able to preach immediately after his, his Damascus Road experience, so he must have been very familiar with early Christian ideas. Um, anyway, there is a case for divine intervention there, but Skeptical psychoanalysts will say what he was doing was rebelling against Jewish law, rebelling against the Sanhedrin, rebelling against the Jewish father God. Um, and if you have a guilt-inducing God image, this is the projection of a harsh, self-critical conscience onto God, as we've seen. So Paul assumes that the strict way he judges himself is the way that God judges everyone. And that's, I think, why he contribute, that contributed to his insistence on the need for Christ's sacrifice to obtain forgiveness. Remember that obsessional people always have a conflict between a need to conform and a need to rebel against authority. And his writing suggests conflict between a need to surrender to the Father God and rebellion against the Father God by revoking Jewish law, which Paul said couldn't give life. He even in accuses the law of inciting sin. I think he had a sense of failure because he couldn't keep up with the demands of the law. Um, anyway, I think he, his intense ambivalence about the law became intolerable, and this contributed to this emotional crisis that forced him to join the Christians. But I think his constant emphasis on sin suggests that he had a, a tyrannical superego. Um, so it was a big relief to him when he decided that uh, Jesus' sacrifice would alleviate his burden of sin. Um, I don't know whether you want me to go on about Paul, which I could do, or whether you'd like to discuss this some more. Well, I, I'm curious. Um, Richard Rohr, who writes a yeah. lot on Paul, yes. suggests all of the above of what you just shared, but suggests that Paul kind of went through an individuation process. Um, and some of his letters, like Corinthians, give expression to that. Yes. Um, so um, my question is, again, this sense of psychological redemption. Do you see any of that in the writings of Paul? Yes. Um, do, do you mean, to, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry. Could you just rephrase the question? The, the, the question is, uh, you know, Richard Rohr suggests that there is a journey that Paul takes and it's yeah. Yeah, an individuation journey yes, that yes, you've yes. shared, but yeah. there is a kind of redemptive sort of individuation that occurs as you read the letters and as you see Paul on his journeys. Do you get that? Yeah, sense? I think that's correct. I think that um, he, the way he dealt, um, see, he he turned Jesus into the figure that Paul turned Jesus into. Paul didn't just transmit Jesus' teaching. He turned Jesus into the figure that Paul needed him to be, into a figure that saves all humanity. And I think what happened to Paul was he needed someone to idealize. He needed someone who could provide wisdom and soothing and strength that he could, he could merge with. So That's Jesus, why he, Jesus was in some sense Philemon for uh, Paul. He, yes, I think, I, I, I think so. Um, and I think you see the intensity of this need by his insistence on controlling uh, other people's belief. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but you can hear the strong identification when he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's a very intense uh, identification with Christ. Right, and may the mind of Christ be in us. Not yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm very interested in, in uh, also a kind of uh, 
masochistic streak in Paul. He, he says he takes pride in suffering, weakness, hardship, insults. And he says, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. I often went without sleep and food and shelter and clothing. He suffered flogging and scourging and stoning and drowning and fasting and imprisonment. And he, he kind of glories in this kind of ill treatment. And he even did it to himself. He says, I pommel my body and subdue it. So this kind of asceticism became very ingrained in Christianity, which has always struck me as very interesting because you have this tremendous importance of the incarnation and at the same time a kind of devaluing of the body. It's an extraordinary kind of tension. Yeah, you get the same in Augustine with the the idea of earth and heaven is splitting. If you the splitting is very interesting. Usually they say that asceticism or denial of the body brings you closer to God. But I think it's often based on characterological masochism and the need for self-punishment because of guilt. And if you have those kind of dynamics, then the notion of unconditional divine love and acceptance would be absolutely irresistible. Mm -hmm. So um, again, um, sometimes he sounds very intolerant and, and, and prone to these extremes. But you also have to admire his tremendous courage and his energy and devotion and his praise of love in First Corinthians and his, his, um, his list of the fruits of the spirit of love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness. I've forgotten all of them. But yeah. he had a very profound spiritual intelligence. But I think that this is what he, he personally craved or needed. Yeah. And can we bring this back to the title, uh, Personality and Spirituality? Yeah. Could you speak for a moment on, you know, your, your, your sense of what personality is um, in relation to our spiritual journey? Yeah, I'm really talking about what's technically called character structure, which, which is the, 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 the kind of major defenses that the person uses, whether you use a lot of projection or splitting, that kind of thing. We, we all use these defenses. And... And, and the, uh, the combination of the defenses that we use and how we defend against shame and anxiety, that's what's, what's meant by character structure mm -hmm. um, and the kind of complexes that you had. And I think what, what, what these examples show is that your personal complexes get projected into your theology mm -hmm. so that there is no theology that's complex-free. Right, um, right. So as you mature psychologically and work on your complexes, your, your spirituality also ought to mature. Well, uh, Martin Luther's namesake, Martin Luther King, uh, suggested that his whole social philosophy was premised on the intrinsic value of personality. I'm curious as to whether or not you have any comment on that. He, he, he had a sense of this unconditional love, which expands beyond the splitting that we're talking about which leads from pathology to... Yeah, but the question is, can you, get, can you get past personality? Can you end up with a God image that's not just a function of your personality? Yeah, that's a um, big question. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's maybe where our topic last week, numinosity, uh, brings, comes in. Yeah, yeah. Dana? Yes, Lionel. It, it seems to me that the conversation is steering towards the idea that as we become entrenched or split off in terms of our personalities, that if we don't develop a rather broad view of the numinous, that we risk falling into fundamentalism. And that the way in which we can avoid falling into fundamentalism is through the sense of interconnection or interbeing or honoring what the other happens to be, which might lead us to our next talk where you want to talk about fundamentalism and its relationship to terrorism. But just right now, maybe you would say something about how do we become less enthusiastic about the divine beings that we associate with? The ones you that... Know, people, people use their spirituality as what's called a self-object. Your belief system is something that holds you together. It acts as glue. It comforts you. It soothes you. It's something you can idealize. It, it's something that you can live up to. 
you can't let go of that kind of thing very easily. People use psychological theories for the same reason. People cling to their psychological theories because they're, they're comforting uh, and it's what we know and so on. So, so um, a lot of fundamentalists are um, clinging to a particular very concrete set of ideas that they get for essentially from a book or from doctrine and dogma because they don't have internal structure. They, they have to use external structure. Um, if you have a, a clear set of guidance about how to behave, you don't have to decide that kind of thing for yourself. So it's very difficult to give up rigid psychological um, beliefs psychological beliefs that that glue you together I, I don't think this is an easy there are ways to escape from fundamentalism but not without a great deal of psychological pain and personal psychological development do fundamentalists tend to breed or raise other fundamentalists yes they do because um they tend to produce families with a lot of rather harsh punishment in them authoritarian they tend to be authoritarian that's a serious indictment about who we've become as a species, isn't it? <laughs> that was <big> <laughs> yeah, yes. 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 Um, we, we have very fragile egos. We have very fragile you know, I, It seems to me that this falls into one of the liabilities of forming the separate self. And as we become convinced in the efficacy of the separate self, we don't inhabit it as we, along with doubts about it. So we become convinced of, of the viability of the separate self. And it seems that that is both a trap and a problem. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an issue. You're dipping your toe into the non-dual traditions here, well, uh, and I, which, and I, which would deny the separate self. I, I'm looking at, at these as ways of stimulating thought, the whole notion of our community. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. For the community, for, mm -hmm. for the community the, the, to, to remain vital, it has to have a, a sense of centeredness that includes everybody and it's not about a figurehead or a particular person or something like that but it, it gives everybody in the community um a, a sense of being a sense of entitlement mm -hmm. will do you have any questions so many uh <laughs> thank you lionel uh again uh just just revelations all all morning um I want to ask you, you know, individuation, sometimes we think of it as something that's happening as a very internal process, but we talked last week about uh, participation of the, of the inner self with, with our world and also with, uh, and today we talked a lot about relationships. So one of the things that I, I teach, just teaching character structure from a story point of view, is that we can often... Uh, build in a relationship with a father, for example, or a relationship with a god into a character's relationship with a boss or a coach sure. or something like this, right? It's and projected. So, it's a transference phenomenon, yeah. Right. So, so what I'm wondering is, uh, to what extent do we seek out relationships that either echo back a negative god image that's blocking our growth or to what extent do we seek out uh, the image that is the kind of antithesis, maybe the one that we need to move towards? And how much is the God image the direction of individuation as it individuates itself? Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, I think you asked several questions. That, that yes. There is the, the phenomenon of, of the repetition compulsion where we, we tend to unconsciously repeat the same problem in our relationships over and over again perhaps in an attempt to, to deal, to get it right this time. Uh, and that can certainly lead one into marriages and, and work situations where you repeat early, early object relationships. So you end up with a boss who's like your father or mother or something. And flip around, do, are we also attracted to 
the, the healing version, the opposite version. Yes, Let's yes. But, I, you, but I don't know. I don't, you said the word extent. I don't know what the percentage is, but sometimes you can get into a compensatory relationship. You can have a God image that compensates, or you can look for a, a relationship with, with a spouse or a partner that compensates for what you had in childhood. But I don't know, I wouldn't like to say what percentages there are. Oh, of course. But, the, but the, you're right to point out those dynamics are very important. And then what happens if we're attracted to that healing opposite and then we don't change? We start well, yeah. to and even worse, sometimes you, sometimes you can force a partner to behave like an abusive parent. You can mm. subtly induce them to behave that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also true that a new good relationship can be very healing and very helpful. So yeah. either can happen. Thank so, uh, should we open this up to the uh, participants? What do you think? Yes. If we have any questions from the participants, please uh, put your questions in the chat room or raise your hand in the chat box. This has been a very provocative uh, session. Thank you so much, Lionel. Yeah, I, I, I hope I haven't offended any believing uh, Christians because I'm not trying to dismiss the tradition purely as a set of psychological structures. As I said, none of the psychology uh, means that the, uh, the beliefs themselves are not correct. I'm trying to say that the psychology colors our beliefs. Mm -hmm. yes. Perhaps that we can't get to a real God without getting past all of our concerns. Exactly, exactly. And you may have to let go of the... There's a, there's a famous story of the little girl in Sunday school who's busy drawing. And the teacher comes up to her and says, what are you drawing? And she says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher says, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the child says, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you form a God image very early, but it's unconscious. And the more you make it conscious, the more you can take back those projections and, and have a, a, a much more realistic God image. So, Lionel, when, when Jung split away from Freud, I believe one of his first steps was to step into, after his own psychological issues, mm -hmm. to step into the topic of typology. Uh, and, and maybe this relates to what we're talking about a little it bit. It does. It Quantum does. Yeah. Acts around our own typology. Yeah. And our psychic function. Could you speak to that just for a moment? Yeah. Well, diff um, people with different typologies uh, very often um, experience the divine in, in different ways. People with an intuitive temperament tend to have a, the divine as a sense of internal presence. Um, people with a sensing temperament. Uh, tend to be very interested in sort of bricks and mortar and the concrete uh, details of the tradition and ritual and the details of, of uh, bells and smells. And, uh, you know, people with a feeling, strong feeling function tend to be very interested in the history. I think people with a strong thinking function tend to get involved in, you know, uh, doc details of doctrine and dogma and scholastic arguments and so on. So, so there is a relationship between typology and one's God image and spirituality. To the, to the Episcopalians, I think Rita has a question about the need for Mary or the feminine today. Yeah. Could you uh, res respond to that? She, she would like you to comment on the need for Mary uh, today in the psyche. Well, the... Um, Mary is a very important feminine presence. And that's why <clears throat> when um, the Pope pronounced the, the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary, I think it was about 1950, Jung thought this was a particularly important development in the evolution of the Christian God image because she became the Queen of Heaven. She was taken bodily up to heaven um, and, and, and became a sacred marriage at Hieros Gamos between God and the Goddess. And uh, he thought this was a very important addition of the feminine element of the divine to what was otherwise a too masculine a God image in Christianity. So, uh, and she's, but devotion to Mary has always been very important for people who needed a, 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 a mother goddess. And um, that's perfectly good for a lot of people. It sort of turned the Trinity into a quaternity for Jung, right? 
Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you can, you, uh, he was a little bit ambivalent about that because sometimes he says that we should add the feminine element and sometimes he says we should add evil. Mm. So it's not always clear which he wants to add, but uh, and Tyler has the question, how does identification with evil factor into this? And I believe we're going to have a whole session on mm -hmm. evil. We are. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of a big subject, but, but it has to do with the fact that in, in Christianity, there's a tendency to see God as only loving and light. He is only light and in him there is no darkness. First, first letter of John. So, so um, the, only, the only real, uh, well, there, there, are, there is some harshness in the New Testament and there's the avenging angels in the, in the book of Revelation, but mostly God is loving and light. And Jung felt this was an incomplete God image um, and that we, we, we need a God image that includes a dark side of God. But this is very controversial. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll deal with it in more detail when we talk about that. Yeah. yeah. And Jessica asked the question, would it be true that if this masochism Paul was preoccupied with led to deification and identification with the God projection of a self-fulfilling ego, that the scapegoat shadow is perpetually justified by this identification? I, I didn't quite un... What, what's the question? That was a big question, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Would it be true that, that if this masochism Paul was preoccupied with led to deification and identification with the God projection of a self-fulfilling ego, that the scapegoat shadow is perpetually justified by this identification? In other words, the scapegoat oh, of the oh. Jews. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if, you, if you have unbearable doubt, you you tend to find a, a, or unbearable unbearable self criticism. You you tend to project that onto a convenient scapegoat, and and it may well be the Jews or the Muslims or some uh, minority group that you can project your own feelings of badness, worthlessness, and your own doubt onto, rather than feeling them yourself. It's a primitive mechanism of projection. It's found in certain types of personality disorders that unfortunately are fairly common nowadays, especially in Washington. Yeah. <laughs> Politics, wow. And Sorry. maybe you see this a little bit in uh, Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac. Um, and yeah. 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 Okay. And so Ginger would like to hear, <laughs> Ginger would like to hear more about the dark side of God. And she says, you just answered my question. So we're well, I barely scratched the surface, but we'll get to it another time. Yeah. We'll get to it well, another time. And okay. I, I think we're in a good place now. I yeah. think what we want to do is transition to, I think it's going to be our next topic, which is fundamentalism and its relationship uh, to terrorism. But all of this has to do, again, it seems to me, Lionel, with drawing a ring around what we think is good and identifying or projecting onto those or some condition that we think is evil or bad. Mm -hmm. And so it stems from a, a psychology. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't have to do with anything in the world because the world itself is not good or bad. It's just our psychology or our perceptions or as hamlet says our thinking makes it so yeah we always assume that my values are god's values god is always on our side and what i think is important god thinks is important i mean the prophets did the hebrew prophets did that Every, everyone does that mm -hmm. whatever is uh, whatever i think is good and moral is what god thinks is good and moral mm-hmm so, Michael Lynn, uh, I don't know if this is a relationship, Will, that you have, but suggests that perhaps the images presented in the New Testament uh, represent an evolution of the God image or God concept. Uh, would you speak to that? Yeah, I think, I think they do. Um, but I don't think the process has stopped. I, um, that's why, as I think I talked last time about Edinger's notion of the new dispensation. Edinger thinks that 
the approach to the God image through the psyche, as we talked about last time, is actually an evolutionary step in, in, in our spirituality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would refer that question to the, if the previous, is the previous recording available? I've discussed it quite a lot there. Yeah, yeah, it, okay. it will be. Okay. And so, uh, so we want to thank everybody for being here this morning. Dana, would you like to say anything about what's coming up? Yes. We have a series of talks that are available that are going to be coming up that we're just so grateful to have an audience for these because as as we have said, we originally thought we just wanted to record them and make them available. And then the idea was, well, why don't we do them in front of everybody? Um, The thing that I would like to point out is that we can track the participants when they show up hardly anybody has left and i just think lionel you have a real gift for making deep archetypal spiritual content relevant and communicable to those of us who are looking for what is the psychology and the relationship of our personality to spirituality in general. And with that, I just think we've had a a beautiful hour plus here this morning. I'd like to thank you, Gard, for participating and my good friend and colleague, Will Lynn. And we look forward to bringing another another series of these talks, each one, and we'll knock off quite a few of them and see where this goes. But thank you all very much for giving us your morning and uh, we appreciate this. Thank you very much. We might say amen and a women. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dana.